So my little Leo Bodner pulse generator here, which they sent me for free, so get on them for that, well done. They said they had this one sitting around, and had some marks and stuff on it. And they sent this one to me at no cost, which is great. I tried it, didn't work, but I think I found out why. Um, let me demonstrate this first. You plug that in, and you've got two little LEDs can show up on there. They're lighting up, I don't, actually want, don't know what they signify, but they're working. So it obviously means it's getting power through to the ball properly. So I'm thinking, okay, let's just look more closely. So you can see this side we've got a crack in the solder there. So that looks like it may have moved on the end as well. You can see it's cracked on that side. And that side's got a bit of a crack there as well. So it's probably lead free solder, isn't it? It's, it's not as strong as leaded. This doesn't work so well. And you can see there as well on that side. It's also, see it there? It's got a gap there too. So it looks like this connector might have moved. Maybe set some stress spot on it or something. Maybe some, maybe someone's knocked it whilst it's been connected. I don't know. This side looks alright, but this side here has obviously got witness marks of shifting. Now, if you look at the trace here, this is the critical bit here, the pulse or anything. Is a trace runs up here, it's like a transmission line, and it's soldered onto that trace. Now, if you look in there, you can see what looks like a gap. So I brushed all this, and I've actually stuck my multimeter probe in there, and onto that pin on the center, I can actually get continuity. That's working, but on the trace going onto that resistor on the end of that chip, so that trace right there, um, there's nothing. And there, there is, there is nothing. There's a gap in that trace there, so I think what's happened is maybe when it shifted, it's broken a piece off. There was a piece floating around, I think it was a piece of solder. So it looks like maybe I just need to rebridge that gap and it'll work. So, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to try and fix it, obviously. So it was under the microscope, and there's a closer view, and you can see in there, there's definitely a gap. But it was a little bit floating around, which I brushed away. It's got a bit more of a clean, I think, a bit of dust in here. Um, maybe for my brush when I was brushing it, because my brush probably wasn't clean when I did that. So yeah, I'm going to repair that. The first thing I'll do is secure these edges. See that crack there? First thing I'll do is secure the actual fitting, so the connector itself isn't potentially moving around, and we'll do it again. So there, actually this view here, you can see the crack down the back of that threading really well there. That stands out really well. So, anyway, let's solder this on. I'm not going to use any flux, I don't want to get the ball dirty. I'm just going to use plain solder and see if we can do it now. The ball's not secured down, it might try and float away when I'm trying to do it, but we'll see what happens. This large thermal mass to try and heat up as well. You go, it's flowing onto the fitting, that's a good sign. The board's got a massive ground plane on it, so it's warming up. Is that side done? I want to try and get into that end if I can. I don't know if I can. Maybe not with this tip, it's a bit big. We'll see if we go. That's an excellent hold this with, let's get some tweezers. Moving around is being a pain. Okay, now I can hold on to it. Might need to change tips, but then I'll need a quite a large tip to get into there to get the thermal mass in. We'll see. getting in there is it? I don't use hot air. So it seems to have gone better. Might come back and do some more solder on this one. Maybe it'll fly underneath it like I did that first side. Take a 
promising. Fly underneath. Now I'm not sure it fully flowed on the other side. You see it on the, on the end there moving around, little bubble. Alright. So that's secured properly now. See the other side looks like. Yeah, okay. Now it's got to fix that center conductor. Which you can clearly see now has got to get. So I've got myself a single strand of wire here and we're ready to go. Let's put some solder on it. I just want to make sure it's all really well covered so it's easy to attach. Alright, single strand just like that. Okay. Not too much, I've done a bridge accidentally, but you want enough to better make sure it's going to attach. Just a little bit of residue on there, like that. Now, yeah. let's bring this in and try to attach it. Now, this is going to be a tricky bit. So, a single strand now it looks pretty big, doesn't it? <laughs> so, I've got to get that in there. I might trim it to length. I'm not sure which way I'm going to go with it, but. Um, yeah, I might trim it down slightly actually. It's a little bit long. Alright, let's try and get this thing soldered in. Let's see how lucky I'll get today. Got it in place. Not sure it's attaching to that trace. Oh, there it is there. There you go. It's a bit hard to try and do this three dimensionally when I've only got a two dimensional view, just like you do. I don't have a uh, trinocular microscope, unfortunately. I'd like to get one one day. Yeah, that's better. It's lying down now. Okay, let's try and attach it to this end. Oh, see that? That pin moved. Why did the pin move on a connector? That shouldn't move around. Yeah. Is that the trace there? It's attached to it there. Maybe that's spun around. Is that what's happened? I was just surprised that pin moved as much as it did. That looked like it's like that's not looking too bad there, but it looked like it moved a lot more than that. I think that's the trace. Okay, well now because I kind of let it go because I was surprised by that pin moving, I've got a bit of an awkward position now. I mean, I expected the pin move a little bit, but not that much, and not so readily. Right, let's try and get down here. See that? It's all just disappeared. And yeah, that pin wasn't right. Is that piece of trace? Is the pin still okay? Yeah, a pin must have spun and ripped the trace off the board. Where someone's when they fitted this, they've spun it around instead of pushing it in. Hmm. Okay. Now I know what happened to it. That pin spun around and ripped the trace off the board. Okay. Let's repair it. Now went to that piece of wire I had. Okay, it's going to be a bit more delicate than I wanted. That's okay. That's on the track. 
Let's see if I can straighten this up. Right, let's tack it down like that. Fingers crossed this works. It's too much, I think, but we'll see how we go. Not onto the chassis. No, not onto there. That's it. Okay. That should now work. Now I need to get this gunk out of here. It's, it's, it's dirt in here. I don't know why it's so bad. Get that clean through there. We don't want anything bridging through there. Some of this will be flux residue and, and like this is lead free solder as well so some of that's going to be from that. I've already tried to brush it but didn't really get rid of most of it. Anyway, right, stick some IPA in there. So it's better with IPA in there. Let's give it a flush. See if that does it. Yeah, that looks much better. I'll just hope it doesn't happen again. <laughs> Having a pin spinning around is not good. Very unexpected. So how this water got damaged when someone's had one of these fittings like this, these adapters, when they've attached it, rather than just turn the nut which is what you're supposed to do, you're only supposed to turn the nut and just push the connector in they've been turning the connector to put it in instead so that is not how you do these things in any kind of situation, maybe you put these connectors on you always push the connector on and turn the nut like in connectors and stuff like that, exactly the same you do that to minimise wear and tear on the connectors because otherwise you wear away the gold plating on the pins and stuff like that so it's just a good technique to do that so whoever's used this maybe has spun it give it a chance for the IPA to dry off it's basically gone I think so I think we can try this now and I bet you now it works one thing I'd like to do is put some solder mask over it to help stabilize it but I don't know if it's going to affect it because it's transmission line and sometimes having things around them can cause problems it can like add extra capacitance which in this case could be a problem so I would like to stabilize it with a bit of solder mask I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's probably best to leave it as it is and hope it doesn't get damaged again. Alright, so there you go. There's the pulse plugged in, and as you can see on screen, it's working. So, all the pulses are there. It's doing 10 megahertz, as you can see. It is adjustable in software. You can actually go in there and tune it, and obviously, I haven't done it yet. I need to plug into a BC to do that. But let's bring this over here and look at the rise times here. So, we're getting a fair decent rise time, let's increase the amplitude a bit make it easier to get it and do a single take the jitter away, so that's 650 652 there, do another single 641, 656, 626, 608 so I'd say about 620 is average getting 620 there, so you can calculate what that is as far as what this scope band is supposed to be so this rise time here, this calculates as being 564 megahertz. So there's a bit of a clue there about what's going on. <laughs> so the calculation is quite a simple one. I'll show you it. It's just here. This is what I've got noted down. This is from my other pulsar. I'm going to replicate this and put this in this box as well. So it's 0.35 divided by rise time in nanoseconds. This is in gigahertz. So if you're doing, say, this example here, that come up to 0.25. That's how the response you would get. So in this case, we've got 620 picoseconds here. So we're doing 0.35 divided by 0.62, and that's given us 0.564. Got that? So here is the actual calculation for this particular scope. 0.35 is like a recognized industry standard. However, newer scopes, they are specified as maybe being 0.4, maybe 0.45, something like that. They are sort of saying they're different. But if you actually do analysis, usually 0.35 is still pretty good. Depends on the scope 
architecture, I suppose. But 0.35 is known as historical. That's what's always been used, and it does go kind of go back to analog scopes originally. But digital scopes are a bit different. They may specify 0 0.4, 0 0.45 instead. In which case, you'd use that calculation. This one seems to be more accurate. So if we do this just to prove it, so 0 0.35 divided by 0 0.62. 0.564 gigahertz, so megahertz, right? So that's what we get in there. If I do the same calculation with 0.4, because this is digital scope after all, so if I do 0.4 divided by 0.62, because 645.